better. So I'll say one of the reasons why you see me coming in with um, these funny gadgets is I'm trying out a whole bunch of things. So yesterday's experiment failed, unfortunately. Um, it was horrible. So what I'm trying to do is besides this normal, so what I'm doing is I, I record, I'm attempting to record the, the lectures that we have. Um, this is sad. So that uh, people have a reference. I don't know what happened there. Hopefully this works. Right, so I was saying, uh, I want us to experiment with, with, well, it's me doing the experimentation. So yesterday's experiment failed, unfortunately. The plan is to, besides this, uh, no, but the plan is to just record these, these lectures so that um, you have something other than, Madame, you want to, so that you have another reference aside from, from the slides, right? Now. The lady will probably, one of you will have to move because you're obstructing, but don't know who. All right, so. Right, so I was saying, uh, I'm recording this. this is, yesterday's experiment failed because, uh, is it better now? Can everybody hear me? I'm, I'm like a student as well, sorry? Well, it's her, right? She's supposed to fix it. So anyway. Um, I was saying uh, yesterday's experiment failed. I was attempting to, do you have an extra book we can borrow? Anybody? No, because it needs to be raised somehow. So there's, in the, in the notes, right, there's a, there's a link to like a YouTube playlist. And so what I'm doing is uh, all these lectures that we are, we are recording, they're like screencasts, right? Hopefully this is working. I think it is working. Yeah, it is working. Uh, so yeah, you can refer to them if you want to. All right, so lecture number two, right? Uh, an introduction to, uh, yet another introduction to computing and just gonna look at some major historical computer system milestone, right? So things that have happened um, in the past up to, I guess, this point in time. And, and our emphasis, you notice, is especially once we start looking at um, the five generations of um, computers, our emphasis will be from the mid 1940s or the 1940s all the way up to the present day, right? Uh, but there are a few slides dedicated to some interesting devices that were built or designed back in the day um, that are classified as computers, right? So that's today's class session. All right, so just uh, before we, we get to it, uh, I'm suggesting that we move the Tuesday slot to 10 hours Thursday, right? No one is busy then, right? Who's busy? Fine, we'll discuss this afterwards. And I thought, I thought no one was busy because we have this slot on the timetable, right? It's fine, but we'll discuss this afterwards. We don't want to waste time with this. Or I'll chat to the class reps, right? So uh, the, the Moodle site is up and running and um, the individual of the unit which is supposed to help us with your training on how to use the Moodle has tentatively agreed that the training takes place Wednesday next week, right? So this is a thing here. We'll have to make a plan here because we don't, um, we are working with somebody else's schedule so we just, we cannot change what they're suggesting. So if you don't have time, you just have to figure it out or maybe uh, make sure that you make friends with someone who's going to attend the session on Wednesday, right? So, there will be a training session, a Moodle training session on Wednesday during this slot. Uh, and then we're supposed to, I thought Thursday was going to work, we're supposed to have the first quiz on Thursday, but 
we'll, we'll, we'll see what, what happens. I mean, if we can find a slot, then we shall, wait a minute. We do have, this This is not occupied, right? This is a normal, it's okay. This slot is okay, right? Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, Wednesday. So, yeah. so Wednesday there's training. I, th I thought the, the, the move from moving the, the Tuesday slot to Thursday was going to work, which is why I was suggesting we have the first quiz on Thursday, which is next week. But it appears people are busy, so we will find another free slot where we shall have this quiz. Um, yeah, all right. So in terms of the outline, the things we're going to discuss in this lecture series, we just contextualize everything. Um, and then just again revisit this whole notion of like the fundamental differences between the computer systems and computer architecture. Because remember we said that we, we are um, splitting this course into two core parts, right? Um, and then we'll start looking at some, some major milestones that have happened in the past, and then look at the evolution of computer systems in reference to the five main computer generations. Uh, I guess we already discussed this, right? We all know why we're doing this. Uh, it's not just for grades, but we mentioned that um, you need the knowledge that you're going to acquire from this course uh, for things that you're going to do in second year, third year, and fourth year, right? Um, at second year, I know for a fact that you, you do an introduction to computer programming course, and it's, it's usually what is, it's, you, it's easier generally for you to understand computer programming once you know the basics about how computer systems generally operate, right? So computer software and all those things. I mean, you want to understand computer software before you actually start learning how to, to, build, um, to build the software, designing and building the software. All right, so in terms of the distinction between computer systems and computer um, architecture, what we're saying is uh, generally what we're going to focus more on this time around is just uh, look at how, how um, computer software, computer system software interfaces with computer systems hardware, right? So what is the relationship between the two? Uh, we'll soon discover that the, 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 the sole purpose of computer software is essentially to do what we want um, the computer to do on our behalf. It's a machine, so it needs to be told what to do, right? Um, and, and then in terms of the, the hardware, the things that we're going to look at are basically just the high level components, right? Uh, we're not really so concerned about the, the minute details of what sort of components sit on the, on the circuitry that you find in a computer system. Um, and then this thing here will come up a lot, the issue of abstraction, I mentioned it um, yesterday. Essentially, we, we use abstraction to try and better understand something, right? So you, it's, it's, a, it's a technique that is used to simplify things, right? Um, if, if someone is studying human medicine, for instance, uh, for them to better understand how the body works, they'll generally start by studying these high-level uh, organs that we have, right? You don't go into details, it's, you start with maybe how the limbs work and whatnot. Right? So essentially we're going to abstract things. And, and in fact, using our top-down approach as we're abstracting, you notice that we'll, it'll be like we'll be peeling off um, the skin of an onion, right? Um, gradually trying to go deep so that we understand um, how computer systems operate. All right, in terms of computer architecture, like I said yesterday, we'll mostly focus on the instruction set architecture. This is term two, essentially. Uh, but we already have an idea as to what the fundamental differences are between computer systems and computer architecture now. All right, but by the way, everything is connected here, right? Everything we're discussing is connected. All right, so in terms of uh, some, some historical perspective, and it's probably going to be one of those boring lectures, right? History, now, no offense to those of us doing history, but um, studying the past is always, uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but, but, but not bo boring, but uh, yeah, maybe boring, I don't know. All right, so you notice that the, the classification of what a computer was uh, back in the day, at least prior to the 1930s, was essentially um, an individual human being performing arithmetic calculations, right? A computer to compute, right? So any person who was in a privileged position to know how to perform these these basic calculations, and I'm guessing they were basic calculations back in the day, uh, was considered a computer, right? Um, but then somewhere around the 1930s, the, the definition sort of like changed, um, where it was broadly making reference to an actual machine or a device, right? Um, but the modern day definition and the definition that we are 
explicitly interested in uh, defines a computer system as being an electronic device um, that has the ability to accept input, yeah, process that input, because the input is, is data essentially, right? So process that input, um, optionally store it somewhere, temporarily or maybe permanently or something, and then generally produce some sort of desired output. Right, so it's ideally, um, these are the core, core features of this thing we are calling uh, a computer system. It's an electronic device. It has to be an electronic device, right? It accepts inputs uh, or input, processes data or input data, uh, optionally stores it, and then produces output, right? And, and just to mention that this definition is based on the von Neumann architecture. You notice that all these different components is the input output module, the storage is essentially your um, your oh, input output module, uh, the processing is done by the CPU and then the storage of data is di done by the memory unit uh, uh, production and the output is directed towards the input output module as well, right? I can't see here. <clears throat> All right, so, so but just to, for us to, to get an appreciation of this, I mean, we know this, I'm sure, but uh, just to rub it in here, right? I mean, the, Computers are everywhere these days, right? I, I, I personally cannot imagine my life without. Hmm? I don't think it's the, the problem is probably the lights, right? I, I don't know if you need to switch off the lights. Oh, the windows, right? Still bad, right? Much better. Much better. Right. Do you want to move it somewhere? Um, do you have? Um, what, what, what is that proposal again? You're saying which side? Well, maybe. Uh, yeah, we'll have to try that next time. We don't want to start moving things around. We'll try that side. Uh, I can't remember why we started using this. There's a reason why. We used this venue last year, and there's a reason why we started using this. Why? I don't know. And I think she's the only one who can see, right? Everybody else can see, yeah? Yeah, anyway. Uh, right, so in terms of, I was saying that uh, computers are everywhere these days, right? And, and we can probably spend the whole day, if not the whole, not the whole year, but the whole day, maybe the whole week or month, discussing the various uh, case studies out there, uh, scenarios where computer computer systems are, are useful. So I, I thought I'd 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 just um, give a few unconventional examples. Now these are probably things that you might have come across or you've seen somewhere, but I thought it would be nice. I mean, um, there's a lot of um, work being directed towards uh, artificial intelligence, so building um, robots or autonomous robots, right? Um, Boston Dynamics does a lot of this work. Uh, if you go on YouTube and just Google Boston Dynamics, there are a lot of cool videos that you can see. Um, I really like this example because it's uh, localized. Uh, so Zesco has these prepared gadgets um, that you use to, uh, I guess, purchase additional electricity units and check your, your units. Uh, uh, or check the previous meter reading. Um, so you, you use a combination of different keys, just like you use the ESSD codes. Um, use the same approach here to, to specify if you want to, to generate some sort of monthly report. So you want to figure out how much electricity you consumed last month, for instance, or last week, or yesterday, right? Um, this is a, an iSchool initiative, so High school is working towards um, trying to make education more effective. So what they do is uh, they use um, prebuilt tablets, arguably cheap tablets, and then they load them up with um, learning content. I, I think currently they only go up to grade grade seven. So they have content from grade one up to grade seven, um, and this this content is so the, the tablets that they sell um, clustered into three. So there's tablets that are meant for learners or students. Uh, tablets that are meant for teaching, so for teachers. And uh, the, the other edition is called the home edition. So 
this is ideally supposed to be used in, in collaboration in conjunction with the parents, right? So if there's homework, then the parent will use the home edition to try and help or guide the child. Um, there's, there's a lot of exciting work that is being done uh, by way of space exploration. Um, that's the International Space Station here. Uh, now this is interesting. If you look at our definition of an electronic device that accepts input processes, the data, stores it, and produces output, then by convention, obviously, it makes sense that these things that we see, the traffic lights, right, when we are on a bus or driving around and the lights turn red or green, uh, we know that there's some input that goes there and the output is red or green, right? There's obviously some processing that takes place inside. It's, it's probably some automated process, like the, most of the traffic lights that we have here are probably automated in such a way that they, it will turn red for a specified number of, of seconds, right, or minutes. Um, and in fact, what I've noticed in certain parts of, I could be wrong here, but I've, I've observed vaguely that in certain parts, what the traffic lights will do is the, the frequency within the, the switch from red to green, um, or amber, I don't know if there's amber as well, changes, right? Like in the evening when they know that there's rush hour, obviously it's going to be different than when it's a, uh, what, off peak period, right? like right now. It's not that busy, is it? People are busy at work. I don't know if it's almost lunch, right? So by convention, obviously, one would argue that this is actually a computer system, right? Type of computer system. And really, we'll, we'll understand why this is a computer system once we look at the different categories in the next lecture, right? And I thought this was nice. Now, is a, is a story about, I think, I, I don't know if I have, uh, okay, I'll explain the story right now. So people are increasingly using this, uh, and I know a lot of us in here are using this, right? Or have these, anybody used the drone or something in here? Anyone know a drone you have? Now, it's illegal, right? You know that? Yeah. Strange, really. I was talking to someone um, the other day. They work from engineering, and um, so they, they do, I think they're obsessed with doing research in robotics, and what they were telling me is that, um, I don't know which body is responsible for, for this, but uh, apparently it's illegal for you to fly a drone. You need a license before you can fly it. Unless if you're flying it within the confines of your private property, right? Which is what I do. It's not my private property anyway. Uh, but maybe in the next class I shall bring this. It's one of those cheap ones. I was just curious to see how this quadcopter works. But uh, once we have a broad discussion about what a computer is and we look at the different categories, we want to see some of case examples. Not just this, right? This is, the, when we are saying a computer system, it's not just that thing that's sitting there, right? All right, so I was talking about Mwau. Now, if, if you really, uh, based on the description of Mwau and, and linking it really to our definition of what a modern day computer system is, then we know that the Mwau tablet by convention, or by definition actually, is a computer system, right? It's an electronic device. It accepts input, right? So if you're a child who is in grade one, the input would be like your gestures, right? You're, you're playing around with the touch screen, don't know what you'd be doing there. Um, there's a pro processing that happens internally. Uh, definitely data is being stored. Um, interesting enough, the output is, there's, there's a lot of different things happening by way of output, right? So the child might have headphones plugged in, in which case the output would be sound, right? The output is also on the same uh, interface that you use as um, an input kind of uh, entity, right? So you see something on the screen, right? Um, so if, you're, if the child is watching a video, what they are watching is the output. Um, so again, back to our example, the input here, this is interesting. I, th I thought I did really put this here because uh, one of the things we discussed yesterday was this notion of, um, you know, we we're talking about input, we mentioned yesterday that it's, it's not really the case always that the input is coming from the human being, right? Now, interestingly enough, what, what the Helicute uh, quadcopter, what the people that designed this did, in addition to this gadget here, is they, they've come up with, or they implemented an application, right? So it's an app that you install on your phone. And so besides the, the actually handheld controller, you can use your phone to actually control the, the quadcopter. Now, Obviously, if you're using your phone, then your phone is the input device, right? So the phone is not a human being. So I thought I'd put it out there, right? So input is either coming in from that handheld um, device uh, or the mobile device application. Um, and then there's processing that happens in here. I mean, as you are fly flying it, obviously, um, depending on how, how much you, 
you, um, you move your finger or something on the screen, if you're using the mobile app, uh, it will probably move at a much faster rate or a much lower rate, right? Uh, same goes for the controller. Depending on how much you move the, the knob or the joystick, um, then the speed increases or decreases, right? Uh, so that's input. Um, and then in terms of processing, obviously, I, mean, I don't think this is that sophisticated, but there are certain autonomous drones, like it's coming here, that will automatically uh, determine where they are located, right? So they use GPS, right? Um, and then internally, it's doing processing to figure out where it is, right? Because it's autonomous, one of the objectives is it needs to figure out where it has to go, right? For it to figure out how, where it has to go, it has to periodically calculate its position, right? Um, so there we go, processing. Uh, it has internal storage, temporary and permanent. I think you can also slot in a micro USB, a micro SD, SD card in there. Uh, but what I do when, because it also has a, a video camera, what I do when I'm getting video footage is I'll use my mobile phone, in which case the video is actually stored on the phone, not on the device. So the device is getting the video footage, but that's automatically being transmitted to my phone. Again, the transmission of the data that is being generated by this drone, not the drone, but the camera itself, is being automatically transmitted. The output is being transmitted to the device, right? So it's not a human being seeing the output again, it's a phone. And then I use the phone to see the output, right? Right, I, I thought I would put, put this out there just to underscore the fact that um, when it comes to these things we're calling drones, right? I mean, it's not, they're not just used for fun, right? There are people that are using drones for a very serious thing. Uh, so a company called Zipline International, uh, please visit this URL. Um, they've, they've come up um, with these autonomous drones which uh, they call Zips, surprise, surprise. Um, they're autonomous because all they do is they feed, in, they feed them with input data on where they're supposed to go. And interestingly enough, um, they work in the health sector, they're used in the health sector. So in Rwanda, for instance, what they're used for is they're used to, to deliver um, uh, things like vaccines to remote places, right? So Rwanda, just like Zambia, has certain places where, uh, where, now we have Estonia here. Rwanda, just like Zambia, has certain places that are impassable, right? Like, well, I don't know, I'm told there are places in Zambia where vehicles can't go or something. And when we have elections, apparently ballot boxes are delayed because you need to use boats and whatnot, right? So, what Zipline does in Rwanda is they deliver important things like blood, right? So if someone needs a blood transfusion in some remote health center, um, the people there will use uh, SMS or WhatsApp apparently to send details of what they need. So need a blood transmission, uh, trans this person needs to be, uh, needs some blood, right? Um, so please send this much blood or we need vaccines in this area, please send this much vaccine. Um, what they send um, besides the request itself is where they're located, obviously. But perhaps not, perhaps the location is automatically computed because we know that um, these days, I mean, if I'm browsing right now, if I send an SMS, Airtel knows exactly where I'm sending the SMS from, right? Sorry, I'm using MTN. MTN knows, right? All these things are being captured somewhere, right? So you can automatically determine where uh, all that is taking place, right? Again, pay particular attention to, I'm ranting about all these things because I'm trying to, again, um, refer us back to our definition of what a computer system is, right? So pay particular attention to things like the input, what sort of processing takes place, right? Where data is stored and the type of output that is produced. Now, I have a question, right? What do you think is the output here? So there's this autonomous drone and I'm at this remote health facility and I say, well, let's say this remote health facility is in Kanyama. I send an SMS say, I'm in Kanyama and we need vaccines, right? They receive the, uh, the input and then they send this autonomous drone. What is the output and where is it sent to? Yeah? Hmm, okay. Okay. Yes, anyone else? That's true. Right, so uh, uh, I deliberately asked that because, again, just like input, when we're saying the entity that is uh, providing the input might not necessarily be a human being, when we're talking about output, it's not just, um, it's, it's, it's better we think of output in terms of the desired outcome or the objective, right? Don't think of it in terms of what you see. So it's not always sound, it's not always um, 
it's not always something visual that you will see, right? Um, it's a whole range of things. That would be interesting. I wonder what the output would be here for these things here, right? Anyway, all right. Uh, and then finally, I thought I would say this again because uh, it was in main, it was all over mainstream media, right? So there's New Horizon Space Probe, which was launched sometime in 2006. Um, I want you guys to pay particular attention to these things here, right? Because it's so far away from from Earth, right? There's a lot of interesting things. So small. I mean, the the type of computers that they have on board this uh, space probe here is is small, obviously, for obvious reasons, right? And the mere fact that it was <laughs> built in 2006 means that uh, there were certain disadvantages here. But bottom line is one uh, we are pointing you to the fact that there are other interesting applications, right? Like space exploration. Um, I, I was tempted to use uh, Voyager 1 or Voyager 2, which were both launched, I think, in 1977 or something, right? And they're still running up to now, right? Um, but I figured this would be better. But look at this, right? When, when, when a signal, when, when this thing needs to send a signal back to Earth, it takes, at least at the time they were writing this article, which was sometime in January last month, it was taking six hours to transmit a signal, right? So if, if the people that are manning, that are somewhat supposed to, or wanting to send a signal to New Horizon, send it, it takes six hours to get there, the response takes another six hours, maybe 12 hours, right? What they're saying is the data that it collected when it was, um, I think it was uh, exploring or studying the, is it the Cooper belt or something, apparently it's going to take a total of 20 months to transmit all that data back, right? Um, but in the meantime, this thing is still moving, right? So anyway, payback is input processing, data storage, and output here. So in terms of the major milestones, right, before we go to the uh, five generations, sorry, before we go to the five, five generations, it's, there are certain classic, classic devices that were not necessarily electronic. For instance, the Abacus was not electronic. That are worth mentioning because of because of, of the processing part, right? Um, so this device here was uh, invented in the 14th century, right? Uh, somewhere in the 1500s, or something. And what it was used for is, in fact, it's still in use. If you Google it up. If you go on places like Amazon, I'm sure you can buy an abacus, actually. Uh, so it was used to perform basic um, arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication. And you notice as we go along that the, really, even though we're talking about uh, oh, input and processing and data storage and output, fundamentally what human beings have always been obsessed with, because we're lazy by nature, what we've been obsessed with is this notion of automation. How can we automate what we do every day, right? Farming, I mean, for, for decades, people used hoes and whatnot, and people started thinking, I mean, why, why, why can we not use things that are more effective, right? So automation. So the same thing goes to, uh, applies to computing, right? So people, since time in memorial, were obsessed about how, how they could sim simplify the, the uh, process of computing things, right? And incidentally, uh, behind the scenes, what a computer does is it performs these basic operations. You will see this next time, I promise you. This is strange, really. Say, you're typing, but internally what the computer is doing is interpreting those, those commands into basic arithmetic operations. You know, add this operation so that you move, um, uh, you move this data to this re register location, for instance. Right? So, Anyway, I mean, something else worth mentioning is this device. It was uh, invented by Pascal in the 17th century. Um, again, similar to this, uh, it was used for basic arithmetic operations. Except this time around, you notice that the difference here is, uh, this is this is more or less like a machine of sorts, right? Uh, this, this is not a machine. I mean, maybe it's a device, but it's not a mechanical. It's not a mechanical device, right? It's, it's a manual device, anyway. Um, you don't have to write these things, they're uh, going to be available for you. But you can write if you want. It feels nice to write. But also, apparently there are studies that have been done where that uh, story time, because I see people are bored here, 
there, there are studies that have been done that uh, seem to suggest that apparently people um, become more effective at learning when, like we, in, in an environment like this one, if you're scribbling things down, or when you're studying, if you're writing things down, you learn at a much faster rate, or rather you retain information more than when you don't, right? But I guess it's dependent on the individual here. Uh, and then uh, Babbage here came up with, uh, uh, you notice we're inching closer to our definition of um, modern day computer system. Babbage introduced an analytic engine here. Um, yeah. Some people will call this a digital computer, but anyway. All right, so now we get to the point where we start talking about the parts we're interested in, the five generations, right? Um, and we're trying to understand the evolution of these five generations. Um, and and this, the development actually was initiated in 1945. I've always thought, right, when people probably, not me actually, I guess a lot of people think about this. There's, usually there's some good that comes out of chaos, right? You notice that this was a time when uh, we had the World War, World War II or something, right? And, People are obsessed about how how they could be more effective at killing the enemy or something, right, or attacking, right? Um, so there was a lot of work directed towards this. Most it was, uh, I guess, work associated with cryptography and whatnot. But then it evolved. It evolved after the war, or something. Because usually when you're experimenting with these things, like there's a war and you're doing something, what do you do after the war, right? You have to. You've invested money into this, and you have to just move on, right? All right. So. Uh, during our discussion of these five generations, I would kindly ask you to pay particular attention to things like the major technological developments or the technologies, the core technologies that were used. Um, and then also, we'll place emphasis on things like the, the size of the machines that fall within those different generations. So the size, uh, how much the machines cost, um, not the actual cost, but relative to the other generations, right? Uh, the power consumption, the efficiency, and the reliability. And you notice that these, these aspects here, as you go down or up the generations from one to five, you notice that some of them will decrease and some of them will, will increase, right? Like the size, for instance, surprise, surprise, right? This is much smaller than a uh, first generation computer, right? I think this is four or five, I don't know, right? All right, so like uh, for first generation computers, again, please, uh, we are not obsessed with dates. These are just uh, estimates. Depending on the book that you are reading, um, the dates might be, might be different. It doesn't matter, right? What we're interested in are the technologies. Because in fact, the generations overlap somehow. So you find that certain computers that might have been designed in the 1950s actually fall within the second generation. Uh, within the second generation. So we, we just want to pay particular attention to the different aspects, right? and the major technological developments here. So, major technology here is where the vacuum cubes that were used in the first generation, right? Um, and these things do nothing more than just regulate the flow of electricity, they, they did that. Huh? I don't know if they're they are still in use. I remember when uh, my parents first bought a, a television set, it was one of those big sets which had a vacuum cube, right? So, in the 90s, that technology was still in use, right? But hey, but some of the traits here, these were like really huge machines. Classic example, ENIAC, right? Look at the size of the computer here, right? Uh, it would literally fill the whole room, like literally it's feeling that this is, everything you're seeing here is a part of the ENIAC, the machine itself. So you have magnetic tapes here for storage, right? And I guess the processing was probably taking place somewhere here. I don't know what this is. Uh, if you're curious, YouTube has, um, a lot of nice footage. So if you just Google up ENIAC first generation computer, you probably, you're bound to find video footage. I mean, this, most of these things are actually in museums somewhere, right? So, I mean, they're probably videos so if you want to um, get a sense of doing this, right? Quite naturally, because this was the early stages were extremely expensive, right? Just like, uh, like I remember when mobile devices came on the scene in, in, in the Republic, right? Uh, the funny thing was the SIM card was more expensive than a mobile device, right? Which was strange, but that's because um, the, the technology had just been introduced. So similar to computers, these were extremely expensive because of that, right? And usually it was places like uh, research institutes and universities and perhaps um, um, large organizations that could afford these sort of devices. 
right? And organizations that were willing to invest money because they knew what they were getting in return, right? Like you spend money to buy a mobile device because you know what you're getting in return, in return on investment. Uh, the consumption of power is nothing compared to, again, I'm making reference to things that we use a lot here. Right? I'm making reference to this generation four or something, microcomputer, generation five, depending on what you want to call it, but generation four. Uh, size, right? Cost, um, and the technology. So these things used uh, punch cards and magnetic tapes for storage, right? And in terms of the programming language that was used to, because you remember, um, mentioned, I don't know if yesterday, I don't know if I mentioned today as well, that uh, this gadget there is useless without the software, right? And that software you discover next term that it needs to be written somehow, um, you need a programmer to write the software, a programmer needs to use a programming language. So the programming language that was used um, to write software for these things here was actual machine language, ones and zeros. It's a tedious task, right? It's error prone. Um, because as human beings, we're not, we not good at that, right? We're good at, at, at figuring out patterns, but, but really when you have a stream of ones and zeros, a lot of them, it becomes hard for you to figure out what's happening, right? So you can easily make a mistake. Especially that you're just working with two things, right? One's one and zero, you literally replace a one for a zero and then oil break, breaks loose, right? Um, and then for second generation computers, um, the major technological development here was the transistors, right? Um, and in terms of these aspects that we're discussing here, you notice we are discussing them in reference to the previous generation. So these were relatively smaller in comparison to this. You can see from the image here, right? So this is IBM uh, 1401. Uh, much, much faster, right, than this device. And understandably so, because if you look at the years, even though we're saying we shouldn't place emphasis on the years, if you look at the years here, there's like a, a decade in between. So uh, people are thinking, people are coming up with new ideas, and, and, and when you're coming up with new ideas, normally when you, gen you come up with an idea, somebody else will, will want to replicate that idea, right? And before long, you have mass production. When you have mass production, things become cheap, right? So obviously, you're much cheaper. Uh, they didn't consume as much power as the ENIAC, right? Uh, and, surprise, surprise, right? Instead of machine language, instead of ones and zeros, they used assembly language. Uh, we shall be using assembly language next term. It's very interesting, right? Uh, and not just machine language, because of the, again, uh, the overlap thing, right? Because of the period when this is being done, I mean, it's 10 year period. There are probably some versions of first, second generation computers, not probably, there are some second generation computers that used assembly language, and then some of them used, they're saying here, early versions of Fortran and COBOL. No, Fortran and COBOL are high level programming languages, right? So usually when looking at programming languages, there's, uh, there's categories, and we'll discuss this once we're looking at um, computer system software or computer software. Uh, so high level programming language, um, assembly language, and then machine code. Right? Which is why you need a translator. So if you're a programmer who, usually these days, programmers write in high level programming languages, so you need like a translator to convert that um, language, right, into a form that a computer will understand, which is ones and zeros. All right, and then uh, third generation, uh, is there something? Yeah. Can we hold on with the discussions, like the in-class discussions until after class, right? Uh, we don't want to disturb the others here. Right, so third generation, um, major technological um, development here is integrated circuits. Um, and again, because of the period, you notice that some of them employed um, large scale integration, small scale integration, medium scale integration as well, right? But again, when we start looking at the aspects here, you notice that uh, because we are now using integrated circuits, so we can, we can actually place components in, in, in a circuitry of some sort, which is much smaller, then you notice that the size reduces, right? Um, and the resulting machine, a computer system, becomes more compact. Um, and in the process, again, you are increasing the efficiency, right? And surprise, surprise now, uh, there's more things being introduced in the third generation that are not here, right? So things like the keyboard, for instance, and um, 
uh, monitors, right? So for you to see the, uh, the, the output that's coming out from the, from the machine. And interestingly enough here, the introduction of operating system software. And we'll get an appreciation of why operating system software is important once we start our discussion of computer system software, right? But take away point here is uh, operating systems were actually introduced in the third generation. Uh, please, uh, I encourage you to go out there and um, Google up some other examples of third generation computer systems, right? This, these are just some examples that, that um, I was able to find on the web. But, uh, um, because as we are getting to things like this second generation, you have more and more people producing, right? So it's like, uh, first you only have Nokia phones, Nokia phones, and the 310 was quite common in, in the Republic when I was a student myself, but boom, now you have Huawei and all those things, right? Because everybody wants to, to make money, right? And they figured out that it's easy to do things. So same here, third, by third generation, there are probably more companies, organizations that are producing computers and coming up with innovative ideas on how to, to, to improve the efficiency, how to reduce cost, um, to ensure that the power consumption of the resulting machines is significantly less, right? Because when you have a device that consumes more power and I'm an organization that is in the business of making money, it means I'll have to spend more money on power, right? So I want to make more profit, I'm maximizing profit, so I want to invest in something that will not be a money pit, right? Anyway, uh, getting on to fourth generation here, uh, I would like for us to, we're not busy, are we? We still have time. No, we're not. Uh, so the major technological intervention here are microprocessors, right? Um, in comparison to integrated circuits here, third generation, which used uh, small scale, medium scale, and large scale integration, we have very scale integration here, right? And, and now what, what, you, what you have is a sort of scenario where you can literally fit components on, on one, on, on one um, circuit, right? Which is the microprocessor itself. Uh, in one of the labs, when we start looking at the different things that we find in a computer, the tutors will show us um, the microprocessor and where it sits and how small it is. But you can look this information up online and you realize that it's actually much smaller than people think. And in fact, if, if you haven't gone through the necessary training or if you haven't read up on how things work, you'd, you'd find it really hard to, to comprehend that Fundamentally, most of the things that take place in a computer are dependent on the central processing unit, the microprocessor itself, right? So, anyway. Uh, so, surprise, surprise, we're saying things like mobile devices actually fall under the fourth generation. Um, you have things like embedded computing coming on the scene. Um, yeah, and apparently the mouse was invented in the fourth generation period, right? And then we come now to what people are obsessing a lot about, right? This thing they call artificial intelligence, right? Um, there isn't really much technological in interventions here, uh, but really it's, it's people obsessed with the techniques to use to try and make um, the way we interact, the process of us interacting with computers more effective, right? So instead of you uh, typing on the keyboard, people in this generation started obsessing or obsessing about voice input, right? You know how if you have a thing, uh, I don't know if people have used Siri or Google Voice, hello Google, right? So here you can search on my phone, I don't have to type in the search phrase if I want to search for information, and you just uh, use the uh, microphone here and just search the history of Zambia or something, and it, it does like a speech synthesis behind the scene, and essentially all that is just software, right? So people are designing software to do that. Um, natural language processing, image recognition. I was sitting in a really interesting talk, well, I suppose it was interesting, nothing novel about it, but this master's student um, was doing a public defense a few, a few, is it before last week actually? And what, his, what he was working towards is to, he's proposing a way, or he, he pro his, his dissertation proposes a way of automatically um, so in implementing a sort of setup where you have one of the components implemented was automatic is it automatic number plate recognition. So you, you know the checkpoint at UNSA there where you normally have those uh, 
security personnel, people who help keep us safe. They write down, they have a huge book, right? So they write, write down um, number plate of every vehicle coming in because there have been a number of thefts on campus, so be careful. But what he's saying is we can automate that whole process. Instead of using a book, you just have like a camera somewhere and then uh, there's um, automatic like uh, image recognition. So you take a snapshot of the number plate and then you, you remove the noise and whatnot and then you figure out, say this is AAA 1257 or whatever, right? Uh, but all that is artificial intelligence because it actually falls on a branch of AI called machine learning, right? Um, so things, are, things like supervised learning where you have to initially teach this software how to recognize number plates, to say when you see something like this, do this, blah, 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 right? Um, so it's supervised learning one, supervised learning. Um, I have some students this year that are probably going to use some aspects of supervised learning, not number plate recognition, but something easy, right? Uh, and then increasingly, please go look up deep learning, right? Um, people are obsessed with machine learning now. I mean, it's probably the, one of the hottest fields in computing now, right? Um, and it's, it's all tied to the fact that uh, people are doing fancy things like trying to come up with, um, with, with robots that do much more. Robots that are able to think on their own, right? So, you initially train it how to do certain things and then eventually it starts learning on its own and doing more complex things, right? Um, right, so, some of the most, uh, some, some of the like, takeaway points here in terms of like, uh, the impact that these advances have had, like if you, yeah, if you look at what we've done from third generation all the way up to fifth generation, um, some important things to look at here is the technology, like I said, right? Uh, the, uh, I guess what we might call the, um, the ratio of performance versus cost, right? So how much are we giving away so that we have a much faster machine, right? So um, as you go down the hierarchy here, when you're dividing the performance with the cost, how is the behavior like, right? When you're comparing the performance and the cost. Um, interesting enough here, these days, machines are more efficient and they're cheaper, right? Which is why this, this number is much larger here. In the first generation, the performance was directly related to the cost. Right? So, you can actually draw a nice graph here. I thought uh, this slide is, was there last year. Uh, though I thought it's, I always think it's nice to to give like uh, case studies or examples, especially for things that we can't actually do. So there are different aspects here for the Univac, right? Uh, the speed in terms of how fast it was processing um, instructions, the unit time here. Guys, please compare this with what we call uh, the processors these days. They'll say, oh, my phone is, or my computer is, uh, it has uh, a processor that oscillates at, is it, 2.5 gigahertz, right? Now the gigahertz is, giga is what? How many zeros do you need to append there? Yeah, but how many, right? I don't know. Sorry? Five. Gigahertz. What's the power of 10 when you talk about gigahertz? Don't know. Ms. Gondo, what's the, what's the, don't know. It's fine, I'm not putting people on the spot here, but what I'm, what I'm trying is a giga, right? Um, it's about, uh, mega is, uh, kilo is a thousand. It's about nine zeros, I suppose. Uh, now, compare that, so this, the Univac was operating at like roughly 2,000 operations per second. But modern day computer operates at, uh, now how many, how many thousands are those, right? You have, um, what number is it? So you have, if you have a 2.5 gigahertz machine, you're saying it's two with nine zeros, right? Whatever number that is. Operations per second, super fast, right? In comparison to something like this. All right, you can look at, now look at the cost as well, right? This is a lot of money even today, yeah? $750,000. We're probably in the, I don't know how much this is now. Hmm? How much is that in Zambian Kwacha? Eight million dollars. Okay. 
yeah, whatever. I was about to use a currency converter here, but anyway, um, and you can <clears throat> you can actually there are a lot of these graphs here. Um, and you notice this graph here has um, things like uh, the efficiency here uh, on the y-axis, and this would be the. I guess you could look at this as being the generations of the number of years. So from 1945 to somewhere in the 2000s here, you notice that. Uh, Performance is increasing, right, as you progress through the generations, right? And also, I mean, things like the form factor, like the devices are becoming much, much smaller. Power consumption is becoming less. Uh, you can make do with batteries these days, right? Guys, is this a computer? Sorry, is this a, is this a computer system? Hmm? Yeah. Input is what? These buttons, right? When I press this button, what's the output? The laser pointer. When I press this key here, it goes forward, right? Um, but the interesting thing is this input is going to that machine, right? So now, now there's a couple of interesting things happening here. So the laser pointer is interfaced with the computer, which is why I need this, that uh, USB thing here. And then the computer interfaces with the projector to move it. So there's, uh, input is not coming from a human being, but input going to this device is coming from Lighton because Lighton is specifying, I want to go forward, I want to go back, right? There's a pointer. Please think about these things as you are moving around when you see something and you try and relate it to this lecture. Uh, hey, dream about this, right? Uh, please, uh, in terms of like some other interesting things that people are looking at, I'll leave this to you to go and, uh, it's always nice to go and look up fancy things that people are doing. This, this list is by no means comprehensive, and it's, it's there so that um, we gain an appreciation, right? So things like quantum computing, grid computing, DNA, nanotechnology. Fundamentally, right, whether you're talking about things like machine learning and the generations, the obsession is the same. Automation and free, uh, efficiency, right? How quickly can we do things? How can we make our lives much simpler, right? <laughs> Instead of me, going to print the slides, I don't want to print the slides, I obsess about automation, right? Um, I would much rather archive them up somewhere and also have like a, a screencast of the lesson as well, but nothing to do with computer systems. So in summary, right, a quick rundown, and I'm guessing those of us doing history are happy that we had a, a history lesson here. Yay. So we... <laughs> We define fundamentally the things we focused on is the definition of what a computer is. We, we are now hopefully at a stage where you look at an electronic device, you can determine whether or not it's a computer system or it can be classified as a computer system, right? We looked at the different generations of computer <coughs> systems and how they've evolved in terms of the major technological advances and, and, and those core aspects, right? Efficiency, power consumption, the cost, the size, Reliability, how are these things changing as we are progressing? How are these change, how are these attributes or aspects changing as we move backwards, right? If we are to go back in time, now hopefully, and I won't be alive when they invent time machines. If people go back in time, you know, what will happen to the computers they're interacting with? I don't know. All right, uh, are there questions, concerns, comments? Hmm? Yes. Did we go over? Yes, please. And also, uh, I sh we shouldn't have really, we have a lot of time, it's lunch time, or have a meeting. Yes. Uh, ask the class reps, they will show you exactly how to do that. We discussed it twice. But the, the, you have that document? Yeah, so it has links on where to go for this. So after this class, I will go and upload these if I haven't uploaded them yet, so you'll be able to access them there. Hey, look at this, is this work gonna work? Ah, so I have two input devices, which is nice, right? I can do that. And anyway, so these are all, is this a computer system? Huh? Don't know. Thank you very much, I will see you on Monday, right? Hey, listen, uh, sorry, I don't know when we're going to, We'll come up with a plan on um, on this tra once it's confirmed here, and I need to synchronize these things. Once we, we need to come up with a 
plan on the venue, so I shall need to chat with the uh, with the class reps.